Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam Rasulullah wa ba'd. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us again to have a successful Islamic History Month. We are now in the last session, a very important gathering, a very important chance for us to deal with one of the important issues facing our community. And uh, we are blessed with the presence of Dr. Rania Awad, who is a medical doctor with a specialty in psychiatry. She completed her psychiatric residency and fellowship training at Stanford University, where she is currently on the faculty as a clinical instructor in the Stanford Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Department. And she will be looking at the contributions of Muslims to mental health and psychology. And it's such an important topic. It's one of those hidden layers within our society that needs to be brought out. And also, the contributions that Muslims have made throughout history is amazing. And so uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to bless you know, our sister and to bless this month. And we pray that Allah would help us to continue uh, in this important work of Islamic history. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Greetings of peace. I'm really happy to be here with you today with IIT. And I'm very happy to know that Canada is celebrating its um, Muslim Heritage Month and really um, wonderful that we're focusing on the topic of psychology and mental health as it relates to the Muslim community and um, its origins and really kind of the Muslim contribution to this field, which for me has been a source of passion <laughs> in this past many years. Um, but I have to tell you, it wasn't always this way for me. And I imagine it wasn't always necessarily this way and maybe still isn't this way for many of you. For many people, particularly in the Muslim community, but other faith communities too. The topic of mental health and psychology in specific is very foreign or feels like it's very Western, um, something that doesn't belong in our heritage and something that was made up by people who are not Muslim and don't understand exactly what Muslims need in terms of our psychology and um, mental health treatment. So for me, you know, my story begins in that I began first my studies um, in the Islamic sciences in the Dean studies. I traveled to Damascus, Syria when I was a young person and um, studied, you know, in depth the Sharia. Um, for me, my goal really was personal studies of the Dean. When I came back to the U.S. where I was raised, um, I began teaching the Dean while I was in college and so on, knowing that I wanted to help the Muslim community. I thought, particularly women and girls, I thought the best way to serve them is to really um, focus on uh, women's health. And I became really interested in that and chose to pursue a career in medicine. And really for me, my focus in Sharia studies was fiqh and my work was a lot to do with women's fiqh, particularly the rulings related to women and girls. Um, and I focused so much on this and that was my plan. I was planning to become in, in, in terms of medical world, an obstetrician, a gynecologist, somebody who can really work with women and girls um, in their health. So interestingly enough, subhanAllah, in the course of studying and in the course of teaching in particular, even though I was teaching Quran, Tajweed, you know, Sirat, Hadith, Fiqh, you know, other topics, um, what I found over time is that women and girls that I was, were, was, I, was I was teaching would often come and ask me um, very in-depth questions, very personal questions, questions that were much, much bigger and larger than I frankly felt that I was trained to be able to answer beyond the Fiqh and, uh, you know, Islamic legal rulings and jurisprudence. And around this time, I really felt that I needed a little more work in terms of that, you know, in learning how to counsel the community. So subhanAllah, one thing led to another. And um, during my time in medical school, I ended up with a shift in my thinking and in my career choice and considered something I never had thought I would ever consider before, which is essentially psychiatry and thinking about mental health and really what does it mean when we think about not just the physical health of our community members, but the mental health of our community members uh, and both together because physicians study the entire body. For me, subhanAllah, 
what kept on the little voice nagging in the back of my mind always was, but if Muslims had this grand history, as we know, with the golden age in the sciences, humanities, you know, all the advancements we have, even in medicine, how come we've heard of so much in terms of their advancements in medicine, but we don't hear anything related to mental health, at least I hadn't, and many that I would speak to had the same um, feeling. And in fact, so many around me really felt that the entire field of psychology was just you know, garbage, <laughs> to be honest. You know, this was not the reality necessarily, but the perception that so many had. So it was a big, a big jump. And many criticized me actually and felt that this was not the right place to be and not where I could put all my resources and time and the studies, my Sharia studies from previous into. But subhanAllah, one thing led to another. And I really felt like if our scholars, the Muslim scholars, the predecessors actually had made a lot of advancements in medicine, then they must have talked about the mind. They must have talked about the heart and the connection between them. They must have talked about what today we call mental health. And that started a whole new study for me. Um, while I was during my training for psychiatry, I ended up going to Stanford to do my training and studies. And while I was there, I started to work on pulling historical manuscripts from the library, from Stanford and from the surrounding libraries and from, you know, interlibrary loans from libraries around the country and eventually globally and then internationally, pulling in all of these manuscripts until at one point I had, you know, something like 120 some manuscripts in my office and I was kind of pouring through them. And what was amazing to me is that without fail, our scholars not only had talked about mental health, but they had actually come to great advancements in mental health, so much so that I was kind of nearly, you know, just shocked. And every time I would say this to somebody, even some people in the field, they would say, no, no, we haven't heard of such a thing. SubhanAllah. And so with that, you know, today, um, what I want to share with you is, is really that journey and that story. And I eventually founded something called the Stanford Muslim Mental Health Lab, which is a research lab, an academic home for the study of mental health in Muslim communities and uh, Muslim histories. And one of the lines of research, or many lines of research, one of them is specific to historical understandings of mental health from the Islamic era, early era. And I'm going to share with you, inshallah, some of the work that we've been doing so that you can kind of follow along with me and see um, what it is that we've been uh, working on here in the lab, alhamdulillah, and really just so that you're also familiar with um, not only the work that we do, but really the history, the history of Islamic psychology. So many people would say, why put the word Islam in front of psychology? You know, well, for us in our field and in our history, our scholars have used the term ilmun nafs, ilmun nafs or the study of the, the soul, the study of the self. And those two together today, you'll see they actually fit into the discussion of what became, now we know as Islamic psychology. So let me tell you a little bit about this journey and how I really think that if we understood our history, if we revived our legacy, if we knew our history, we would actually be able to rewrite the narrative. This narrative that says we have nothing to do with this, actually should become, we Muslims were at the very forefront of all advancements related to mental health. Let me tell you a little bit what I mean. First, I have to share with you this very important piece that as Muslim scholars, we did not look at things just from a medical or scientific viewpoint. This is what I kept finding in all of the manuscripts that I was looking in. It wasn't just, we, I started, yes, with looking at medical manuscripts, but eventually branched out into the manuscripts related to, today you would call, for example, of kalam, aqidah, or this manuscripts that were related to tazkiyah or ihsan, right? The scholars that were writing about this, so many what we call interdisciplinary, so many disciplines were writing about understanding the human psyche, the soul, the self. And together, together became the, the field they call today, we call ilmun nafs, and today we would call psychology. And what that meant is it was very holistic, which is very a trademark, very much a trademark of Islam. And it wasn't just medical care, but it was also care of the soul and care of the self and the mind and body connection, which you don't tear apart. And I'm going to speak about that more in just shortly. But let me tell you something else. 
if you think what I'm saying is just a matter of just theory, or maybe there was, you know, if you're thinking, oh, maybe it's one or two Muslim scholars that wrote about this, it wasn't a robust part of our history, think again. The impetus for this, meaning the thing that sparked this work, because if you think of the time frame in history in which this is happening, this is happening, the advent of Islam comes, right? And by the next century, you're finding entire hospitals, psychiatric wards inside of a hospital system specific to mental health in these Islamic hospitals. Then over time, you're finding whole institutions, whole institutions, whole hospitals dedicated just to mental health. And they call them Dada Shifa, right? The, literally the place of healing, or they call them, depending on language, Binaristan, right? The place of healing. And what this meant is, and if you look at it, this is early on, the beginnings in the seventh century, then by eighth century, you have the full on Islamic hospital system and psychiatric wards. And you have what we call the interdisciplinary team taking care of the patients in this hospital. So you have a doctor, yes, you have a nurse who's helping the doctor, but you also have, today we would call this person the social worker, the person who takes care of the patient's affairs while they're in the hospital, what they need, and once they're discharged from the hospital to get them back on their feet, including, get this, including actually giving them financial assistance once they leave the psychiatric hospital so that they can, in some cases, three gold dinars in order to get back on their feet and be able to integrate back into society and take two of those dinars and start a business within the marketplace, subhanAllah. The foresight of such a thing, the doctor, the nurse, the social worker, then you have the person who's compounding medications together, right? Because they did use actual medication even for psychiatric illnesses. And then, you know, today we call that person a pharmacist, right? And then they had the person who was the dietitian, who was figuring out the different types of meals needed for each type of illness. And today you have that in the modern hospital. And then they had the religious leader. The person today you might call a hospital chaplain. The religious leader who would come with this team every morning, this whole team of five or six people would rotate on every single and see every single patient in the hospital every single day. This is as though I'm describing to you modern Stanford Hospital, SubhanAllah. But this is our history. This is what's written in the books. Not only that, but when people say, you know, was it just theory? No, it was theory put into actual practice. So I say the proof is in the pudding. We can talk theory all we want, but when you see it actually implemented in real life, right, and actual people being healed and treatments happening, then you realize it wasn't just theory. Not only that, but who funded all of this? This is what's so beautiful about the Islamic tradition. Who funded all of this? We know medical treatment in most societies is very, is very expensive, especially mental health treatment, right? And even when medical treatment is covered in certain countries, right, because of socialized medicine, mental health treatment is still uncovered. Well, in the Muslim lands, it was free of charge because it was taken from the understanding that the person who was the Khalifa or the Amir or the Sultan, whoever was the leader, was responsible for the care of the people under their uh, jurisdiction. And it also meant because of the Islamic uh, emphasis on treating the ill and putting your sadaqah or charity in visiting the ill and in treating them, it was actually very highly prized. So you had so many families who were wealthy who would support this hospital system, making it free of charge. And the waqf or endowment system was used in order to keep the hospitals going. And furthermore, zakat money, the alms charity, was also used in helping those who were underprivileged. And so all in all, the treatment was free of charge. And this is for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. At a time in history, when in Europe, Muslims having their golden age, starting, starting that kickstarting the golden age, in Europe was the dark ages. And where were the people who were mentally ill going? They were going, unfortunately, either at best case scenario, being sent to the monasteries to be treated by priests because it was thought this is all supernatural. This is all possession, jinn possession, or this is all demonic possession, or this is all something that needs to be prayed away. Or at worst, they were being burned, 
as witches at the stake. But in the Muslim lands, we were far advanced than this at the same point in history. So you tell me, if we don't know our history, then we're not going to understand why it is when people today have such issues with modern psychology, they lose track of the fact and say, no, 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 that's not anything to do with us. Not, not only does it have a lot to do with us, but we were at the forefront of the story. And it wasn't limited to just, again, physical or just the mind. Like today, you know, in, the, in, in psychiatry departments, people would say, if you can't reproduce it scientifically, right, then it's worthless. If I can't see it on an fMRI machine, then it's not, it's worthless. But today there's a whole, even in, mo even in modern psychology, there's a whole wave saying, no, you need to bring in the whole person. You need to bring in their soul and their spirit. You need to bring in their cultures and their history. Don't just limit it to just the mind and make it very, very biological and scientific, subhanAllah. And that was how Islamic psychology was. So you see, we used the empirical, we used the rational, but we also had the scriptural, as in to say, Islam and what we had from Hadith and Quran sparked this work. Otherwise, how do you explain that Europe is in the Dark Ages and Islam has this golden age and this amazing advancements in psychology and mental health in the same time period? What changed? What was different in this land versus this land? And there's no better explanation than the advent of Islam and the Quranic injunctions to treat and heal illnesses and to seek treatments when the Prophet وسلم, says Tadawu ibadullah, right? Seek out treatments, O servants of God. Because God does not send an illness unless he sends its cure. These are the kind of teachings that prompt the scholars to actually find treatments for illnesses, including mental illnesses. Now, here I'm going to take a step back and share with you a few of the scholars that we have studied. And we study them from all different perspectives. So you have, for example, just briefly here, some of the philosophers. Al-Kindi and Ibn Mashkwe and Ibn Rushd and Farabi. And each of them were philosophers and, you know, had different opinions. But I'm most interested in what they said in terms of mental health. Because, for example, you have someone like Al-Kindi, who is, has a whole book, right, called Repelling Sorrows. And he talks about cognitive strategies of how to treat depression. And what is he writing? In the 800s. Amazing, right? Or you have Ibn Mashkawai who's talking about self-regulation, which is a term that you only hear in the modern times, right? And he talks about how your behaviors will impact your emotions and back and forth, cognitive behavioral strategies. You have, for example, you know, um, other types of scholars who are really advanced in their thinking, like the theologians, who people might think really were going to bring even those who were speaking of theology into the story here 100% because the Muslim model is a holistic model. It brings in all aspects of the human self into the story. So, for example, Imam al-Ghazali is most famous for, of course, the diseases of the heart. But he talks about how if you don't work on treating the diseases of the heart, like arrogance and miserliness, ignorance, envy, lust, and so on, then you're not going, the heart is connected to the mind and the emotions, and it's connected to your nafs and to your ruh. It's connected to yourself and to your spirit, all of which is this beautiful model, which all of which is connected. And he says, if you don't work on, and the seat is the heart, like the hadith says, right? And if you don't work on the treatment of the heart, then your well-being is going to diminish in every other aspect. But if you work on that mudra, right? That part of the body, that heart, that organ in the body that needs to be rectified. If you work on that, then it helps all the other parts of the self. SubhanAllah. Beautiful models, right? You talk about, you know, for example, I think it's amazing that, you know, someone like Ibn al-Qayyim, who had some really high level psychological thinking and writings is almost never discussed in the field when we talk about psychology. The two names almost never mesh together, subhanAllah. But look at some of the work of Ibn Taymiyyah where he talks about, and Ibn Qayyim, his student and teacher here, right? Where he talks about, look at Ibn Qayyim's work where he talks about if you have, wait, what today in modern terms, we call the cycle of change totally attributed to people other than Ibn al-Qayyim, which is basically you take an involuntary thought, which if you keep on thinking about it, will become a deliberate thought. 
And then it can be, if you put emotional motivation to it, it can actually cause you to have action, which then becomes habit. He's talking about how do you take something and make it a good habit? Or how do you take something that's like an addiction and change it, a bad habit, and, to, and, and break that? SubhanAllah, right? The cycle of change. Or you have the physicians, the physician scientists. Abu Bakr al-Razi, for example, is one of my absolute favorites as well, because he was known to be somebody who created one of the largest hospitals in Baghdad um, and one of the very first psychiatric wards in the 8th century, and somebody who really um, championed mental health and not only had an entire psychiatric ward to treat those who had mental illness, but also that he wrote volumes, case studies after case studies, you know, 900 cases, and some of which were specific on depression or anxiety, or today we recognize these things. And then you have, subhanAllah, the fact that he is accredited probably the first in history to do something called psychiatric aftercare. That concept I was telling you about before, that after a, a patient discharges back into regular society, how do you get them to incorporate back in? by giving them financial assistance and helping them get back on their feet. This is something he kind of wrote about and championed, subhanAllah, and has an entire book, for example, called the Tibb al-Rawhani, right, on really the soul and the psyche and talking about psychological concepts, but from the Qur'an. Or Abu Zayd al-Balkhi, who I've written a lot about and I've actually had several academic papers written about this in medical journals, where I think he's just phenomenal because here he is in the ninth century writing about um, writing about uh, what I saw as a psychiatrist, someone studying in the dean and studying in psychiatry together, I could sense that this was, you know, this chapter here is depression. And this chapter here sounds like it's anxiety. And this chapter here sounds like it's OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, which blew my mind, <laughs> subhanAllah, because when I went through my studies, as any psychiatrist today or psychologist today would, when you go into the section on the history of psychology, they say some of these illnesses are modern illnesses, only discovered in Europe in the 1800s, <clears throat> you know, 17th century, 18th century by Western scientists, and they are the first and credited with the discovery of something like OCD. OCD in particular is credited as the first case study they find is like in the 6th century and not really written about and really classified and diagnosed properly until the 18th century. And they attribute it to a man named Richard Burton. No name of Belhi, no mention of the Muslims, nothing. <laughs> and here is the backstory. Belhi actually was one of, for me, kind of the person who really sparked things because I told you I was re reviewing all these different manuscripts. Well, one of them in particular was al Belhi's and it was a small manuscript in comparison to the others. And it was called Musalih al-Abdan wal-Anfus. This is his original Arabic. And uh, you could translate that as sustenance of the body and soul. So there it goes again, mind, body, right? Soul, body, together. And he actually says in his introduction to his book that he's writing in the ninth century. He says, I'm writing this book, putting the medical illnesses and the mental health illnesses in one book because physicians of my time, in the ninth century, keep ignoring the mental health illnesses and only speaking of the physical illnesses. But I'm going to make sure that we're talking about both. And the two together have to be treated and integrated in order to have the best whole self. Furthermore, he then talks about, which I thought was phenomenal, he says, I'm writing this book in easier Arabic so that even the lay population can understand. So he's really on track here for making sure people really understand mental illnesses, subhanAllah. And then in his chapters, I was reading them, when I came across what I thought he called, as Muslims, we call obsessions, waswasa, right? And we say these are satanic, shaitanic kind of whisperings. And every, every human being has a little bit of waswasa. And Balkhi says correctly that you have some people that take it high level of waswasa. In fact, he distinguished between regular waswasa and between, you know, what he called, you know, waswasa uh, sadr he called it basically waswas al qahri, right? Like it's it's like pathological, you know, it's really invasive waswasa. And not only that, but to me as a modern trained psychiatrist, as I'm looking at this, I said, oh my goodness, subhanAllah, it looks like he has the classification right. It looks like he has all of the symptoms right, 
It looks like he has even some of the treatments right in the ninth century. And it just, subhanAllah. So I went next over a couple of rooms, a couple of offices over was um, the head of our OCD uh, uh, department at Stanford. And he was one of the doctors who was the top five. Stanford is one of the five places that had an OCD clinic, the first ever in the country of, in America. And we had still the founder with us. He's a very old gentleman. And he, at that time, was almost retired. Currently, he's retired. And um, when I went to him and I said, um, and you're, you're all going to love this very much because his last name is spelled K-O-R-A-N. <laughs> Dr. Quran, not Muslim, but a gentleman who was very, um, in, you know, heard me out. And I said to him, I think I found some, I think I found an early description of OCD here, much earlier than we think in by Europe, you know, that was written about Europe. And he said, no, 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 no. And he said, no, no, it can't be. It can't be. I've written everything there is to write about OCD, which is true. If you look at all the main chapters and all the main books and all the, he's the main author on all of these chapters and books. And I said to him, but this is in Arabic and it hasn't been translated. Can you read Arabic? And he stopped and he said, no, can you? <laughs> he said, yes. <laughs> That's why maybe you haven't come across this. He said, but I've written about the Greeks and I've written about the Romans and I've written, and I said, all right, but the Islamic civilization came after the Greeks and Romans and added to that. And then, you know, then later came the European Enlightenment. You're missing a whole chunk of history here. And he sort of paused and he said, okay, here's the deal. You go translate that. Tell me what you think and let's come back <laughs> and discuss it. I said, okay, took up the challenge. Translated all the section here and I'll share with you what I found, subhanAllah. And before I go to the next slide, which is about Belkhi, I'll just make one quick note about Ibn Sina. And, and just so you know, the amount of work that happened in this era and its contributions, you take someone like Ibn Sina or Abyssinia, whose medical textbooks, particularly the canon of medicine, Al-Qanun, right, that is used in European medical schools as the main medical textbook until, some say, about the 17th century. Yet, do you see what era he's in? How do you take something all the way from the 10th century to the 17th century? How do you take 700, 600, 700 years, years of the same textbook over and over and over again before science is updated? And you can't, I mean, today, you know, science is updated every few minutes, but even by historical standards, that is beyond impressive that his work was so deep and so succinct and so advanced that he was way beyond his time but they kept using his medical textbook for hundreds of years. So back to Belkhi. You're curious about what happened, right? So here's what happened. I found, and today I'm very excited to say that one of our predecessors in modern Islamic psychology by the name of Dr. Malik Badri translated the mental health side of the book, and he called it Sustenance of the Soul. So this is available for you to read. And this is what I found. I found, for example, that Al-Balqi talked about, like I said, Masalih al-Abdan, the physical health, and then Salih al-Anfus, the mental health, and he had these different distinctions. Clearly, he had, you know, sadness and depression, which he called jaza, which is completely separated from fears and phobias that he called faza, which is high-level separation at that time. And he separated even further away from it, the wasawis al-sadr, which are obsessional disorders. And when I translated his actual criteria over here for obsessive compulsive disorders, this is what I ended up with. And I want you to see, and this is why we have the slides here, because I want you to see and take a moment and take a look at Al-Balqi's criteria who's writing in the ninth century on the left hand of the screen here. And take a look at the obsessions according to the DSM-5, which is actually the criteria we use today as psychiatrists. The DSM is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for psychiatry that you actually diagnose you know, um, any disorder with, including OCD. I think what you'll see is that each and every point by point by point, Al-Balqi was able to figure out, classify, and diagnose in the ninth century. And when they say they didn't fully discover and fully, fully, fully write and classify and diagnose OCD until the 19th century, then you understand how genius Al-Balqi was and how he was not just a few hundred years advanced, he was a millennium 
9th century to 19th century. This, this here is our Islamic heritage related to mental health. This is the story. Why do I emphasize this so much? Because a lot of people want to say, well, what about, that's beautiful, that history. Dr. Rania, that's wonderful what you found. <laughs> How does that relate to today? Well, for me, I'll tell you, for somebody who has been steeped in both the, the Dean world and teaching the sacred sciences and steeped into the mental health world and really trying to understand the bridge between the two and where do Muslims fit in today, I have to say that this history that I just shared with you is really what makes me tick and makes me excited to do this work. It's because it's the rewriting the narrative. You know, when we go back here and see something like this chart and, and write, and which is, you see, they're published now in academic papers and say, no, we're right, rewriting this history. It wasn't credited to Richard Burton first. It's not a 19th century discovery. It's a 9th century discovery by a Muslim scholar who understood. And furthermore, what he did is he said the treatments are threefold. You treat it by, you have to, now wait for this, it's really beautiful. You treat it by actually giving compounded and he did describe different herbs and medications you would give so there is a physical actual medication that you would take like today we would say there was and likely Belchi might actually be the first in history to talk about talk therapy you must have the rapport of a therapist who you can speak to who's able to walk you through certain therapies and get this he literally describes the kind of therapy we today use to treat OCD which is an exposure therapy. The gold standard of therapy for OCD is exposure therapy, gradual exposure therapy. And he literally describes this in the ninth century. And thirdly, he says, and you need to have Islamic integrated <laughs> discussion into that therapy to remind the person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not forsaken them, to remind them and help them figure out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there and will help them through this and to kind of keep their morale boosted even in this difficult illness and so on and so forth. Beautiful, holistic, this is our tradition. And so what has happened? That's the question. Where are we today with all of this? And many people say, you know, but Muslims today, the ones I know in my community today, they still have a lot of stigma about accessing mental health or seeking a, a therapist or a psychologist. Many say, you know, so many cultures, including the one I grew up in says, you know, you don't air your dirty laundry to, <laughs> to a stranger. So what happened? How do you have all of this in hospitals and programs and treatments? And then today, Muslims today know, A, know none of this or very little of it, had no idea, they had no idea that, the, that we were the first to even create psychiatric hospitals. And, or treatments or therapies or talk therapies or medications or so on and so forth. And today they are very, have a lot of stigma that mental health is a taboo subject. Well, I'm gonna tell you that, you know, this discussion of what happened to Muslims is a much longer discussion we'll have to come to another day, inshallah, to talk in more depth, but I'll give you just a few. One of the main ones, of course, is you have this Islamic golden era that starts with Islam that, and really continues, it kind of shifts where it is all throughout history and continues through the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And all through that time, there's advancements in mental health, all different things are happening, right? SubhanAllah, and kind of more hospitals, more treatments, more modalities of treatments are happening until, unfortunately, the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the beginning of colonization of the Muslim lands. Well. The transfer of knowledge between the Muslim lands and Europe was pretty big considering trade, right? And so many of our thoughts and ideas went into them and into their lands and many postulate was the cause of the European enlightenment. But also some of the backward ideas also infiltrated back into our lands with post-colonialism. Or if there were, and there have sure there were also ideas that were not very <laughs> scientific or advanced in its, you know, understandings that were kind of like emphasized by this, unfortunately, colonial and post-colonial mentality that the Muslims found themselves in. And so you find so many things that were so beautiful about, you know, the Muslim lands at that time, you know, taking this, this idea of like, let's modernize and modernize look like, let's Europeanize our 
systems. And unfortunately, some of that backward thinking comes in and the lack of really understanding the tradition and being tied to our original primary sources and only getting in European sources as the advanced sources has a lot to do with why we ended up losing some of what we have here. And furthermore, this idea that, you know, our Islamic psychology is very holistic. It carries in so many different aspects. And again, modern psychology, psychiatry was very, very biological, very mind driven and neuroscience driven. And so therefore we lost so much of the holistic understanding and treatments that we used to have at some point in time. So we'll have to talk about this in more detail, but that really, you know, in a nutshell, kind of explains some of the fissures and some of the difficulties in the lo losing what we had. So where are we today? And where do we go from here? Because whenever I give this topic in terms of history, it's always important for me for Muslims to understand, you know, and really feel like, wow, this legacy in history, we need to revive it. But also, where do we go from here? Because otherwise, you know, you kind of go up and then you just crash down. <laughs> you look back on your communities, subhanAllah. But I want to tell you that there are many people, many efforts actually in reviving Islamic psychology. And I hope you'll be part of this now that you've been inspired, inshallah. Um, but really trying to understand also, you know, this important efforts that are happening. And I want to tell you not only translations of books that are happening, like Dr. Badri translating Balkhi's, um, you know, mental health side of the book, or for example, you know, different books like Ibn Sina's book or Ed Razi's books that have been coming translated. Our lab at Stanford Muslim Mental Health Lab, which I'll speak to you in a little bit more detail, you know, we're also doing quite a number of these translations and bridging and really pulling out the wonderful concepts that they, these early scholars have figured out so that we can rewrite that narrative narrative and history. But also, there are so many different contributions throughout Islamic history that haven't even been touched yet. So we need people from within the Muslim tradition to be able to have access to that primary sources, who can read that Arabic, who could understand the knowledge and are rooted in it, to go back and actually write our own history. Like we literally need to rewrite the narrative because history is his story. It's always written from the point of view of the conquerors, the ones, the colonizers. You have to go back and write it from your point of view, right, as the indigenous people that it affected. So this is part of the work that needs to happen. And this is part of the limitations, funding people with, you know, rooted in both worlds, speaking the original languages, having access to the primary sources, right? And many of them are there. They're just buried in the dust of time. And we need to pull them back out right, and really put this as a goal for our communities, then that's all theoretical knowledge. Then we need to take that and look at modern psychology and not throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are some things in modern psychology that are excellent, and there are some things that are highly problematic for Muslims. And part of the work that I do, and many like myself who are in the field today, are trying to essentially figure out well, what's the baby and what's the bathwater? <laughs> what do you keep and what do you throw out, right? So you can't just toss everything out, all the advancements that have been made. You have to figure out what can be adapted to Muslim communities. Furthermore, then you need the actual treatments. So so here I always try to, I always like to share this uh, resource, the Muslim Mental Health Lab as a website that you can visit and see the work that we're doing and kind of get inspired inshallah, join if you're interested in, if you're research, if you're research minded and interested in academic work or supporting this work. And knowing that this work is happening, this is kind of the hub or the home where so much of this is happening, but also know that there are also efforts in taking this theory and research into actual clinical practice today for Muslims. And so many of you know, for example, the Khalil Center. And now in Toronto, you have your own branch, mashallah. And the Khalil Center is, is phenomenal, subhanAllah. It's the largest provider of Muslim mental health care in all of North America. You find their offices, well, they started out in Chicago. I direct the, Bay, the, the San Francisco Bay Area offices, alhamdulillah. And now there's Los Angeles offices in New York and Toronto, as you know, mashallah, in your own um, location. And also in Istanbul. And for me, <laughs> when when a Muslim country as rich in its heritage as Istanbul asks the Khalil Center that was started by us as, you know, you know, directed by us as, as North Americans to <laughs> to 
to do, uh, to bring a, a branch there, that means Alhamdulillah, we're onto something. There's something about being Western Muslims, being Muslims, North American Muslims, Muslims who have the access to both worlds, all these you know different aspects of it, to be able to pull together resources and pull, right? And create something really beautiful, Alhamdulillah. So inshallah, I only can see this becoming bigger and better, Alhamdulillah. But what's beautiful about the Khalil Center that I didn't explain yet, is that it's not just the clinic. It's actually an entire wellness center that has multiple branches to it. It has the research, it has the clinical services, and it has the educational services. And so you have all things working together in unison to help educate the Muslim community about our heritage, our history, but then actually about mental health and, it's, and, and how to treat it, and also how to create wellness in our communities and also create the actual physical or virtual spaces to get Muslims to treatment, not just by other Muslims. It's beautiful to have Muslim therapists treating Muslims. I'm talking about another level. I'm talking about not only a Muslim therapist, but somebody who has Islam integrated into the therapy for those who are Muslim who wish to have their Islam integrated into the therapy. So this is very exciting for me. Alhamdulillah, really blessed to be part of this project. And I hope, inshallah, all of you will make use of it. Bismillah. Here are some of the, I like to always give the resources and let you know that these resources are here. And for those of you, and I don't have a slide on this here, but for those of you who are more academically inclined, Alhamdulillah, we published um, a book earlier this year, actually, that's available on Rootledge, that's the um, publisher, or on Amazon. And it's actually called um, Introducing Islamically integrated psychotherapy, and it's talking about you know bringing Islamic Islamic uh, integrating Islamic concepts into clinical psychology space. Alhamdulillah. So, and the third chapter of the book is a lot of the history that I just shared here today with you, and the rest of the book I think is phenomenal in really being able to um, help everybody understand the heritage we have of Islamic psychology, understand how it bridged to modern psychology, and then really take as a theory um, and put into actual clinical practice, like our noble predecessors, into working with mental health in the future, inshallah, for the Muslim communities. So I leave you here with this part of really, um, you know, the contact information for the lab, and, and if you're welcome to follow us, um, to, to follow what we're doing and we're all about, inshallah, and also the same for the Khalil Center, inshallah, and we ask for your du'as, but I hope, inshallah, this is just the beginning of a broader and bigger conversation related to mental health, Islamic psychology, and where Muslims fit into all of this, as again, the ones who are really at the forefront of so many of these advancements. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to understand our history, to revive it, to, to honor it, and to really live a, and fulfill that kind of legacy moving forward, inshallah, for the Muslim community, but for all of humanity. Allahumma amin. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Barakallahu feekum. Inshallah, we'll catch you at another time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.